morning, and I uh, want to acknowledge that we are un on the unceded territory of the Coast Salish peoples, the Squamish, the Musqueam, and the Sioux too. Um, it's a bit actually, it actually is great to kick off uh, an election with you know this this particular panel, this particular forum, this particular debate, because I want to start off by saying that our government since 2015 has done the most in the history of this country in terms of looking at reconciliation uh, with and dealing as nation to nation with the indigenous peoples of this country, all, all the groups, the Métis, the, the Inuit, and of course the First Nations. And when I say has, has actually done, I mean done, substantively done, I don't know if you realize, but most of you probably do, that four times a year our prime minister meets nation to nation with each one of those three groups on a, on a basis of talking as two nations to each other to try to move the agenda forward, to try to plan up what needs to happen. Kind of like we do federal provincial uh, talks every year, every year. So this is something that he is committed to and that we are committed to. Uh, as you know, we started with an apology, which was obviously made under the conservative government, but we backed up when our prime minister made an apology again, we backed it up. We backed it up with substantive uh, information to the standard money. <laughs> one of the first things I think that we are committed to doing is to addressing past wrongs, not just to apologizing for them, but to addressing them and to actually ensuring that we begin the process in a real way of advancing self-determination. The other one uh, we're talking about, especially in which Columbia is particularly pertinent, is advancing and settling claims that are outstanding in which Columbia we know there are tons of outstanding claims. And just recently, we had an agreement with the with the provincial government in British Columbia and the First Nations government in British Columbia to talk about how we will actually substantially change the process for claims, addressing claims, so that it's an easier process and it's a process that can work. And I think, again, what that's talking here about actually putting concrete action behind what we say. Forgiving and reimbursing loans is something that we have done. The loans for comprehensive pay negotiations. And it is done, it is going on, it is actually substantially so. Strengthening governance too, because if we're going to deal with nation to nation, and we're going to deal with self-governing bodies, we need to have strong, transparent, accountable governance too that can actually benefit the nations that, uh, that, that their leaders are trying to move forward. Uh, so, you know, better information sharing so that we can work together to know, for instance, there haven't been very many statistical data pulling out, telling us actually a lot of information about um, about the health statistics, education statistics, etc. of First Nations people in this country. And that is very key. You can't fix stuff if you don't know what's going on. You cannot do anything, you can't move forward if you don't know where all the areas that need attention are there. And we're doing this again in partnership with First Nations people because you know, over the years, I think many governments, well intending, have done some things, but really they didn't amount to results. And we want to get amount to results. We want to get results happening. And you can't tell people how to fix, or your people how to fix things. You have to work with them for them to tell you what are the steps that you necessarily need to make specific. So we're looking also at um, core government support for First Nations in terms of helping them in any way we can with money and whatever is needed for that. Closing the gap. We know right now that substantially there is a real gap amongst, uh, between indigenous and non-indigenous people in this country, both in health and, well not both, but in health, education, language retention, for instance. Um, the gap to be able to actually advance the culture and language is key. All of the immigrants in this country have multiculturalism which helps them to advance their, their language and their culture, etc. And why it's nice to say we're doing this. We actually have put almost $350 million over five years for language advancement. And I want to highlight that under the Harper government, that was $5 million a year. So moving $350 million over five years into language retention, because we know there are many of the elders who are in their 80s or their 90s, and this is an oral language, and we will never be able to have that retention happen, to have that, that language mapped and put into place so that people, young people coming afterwards can actually learn and be proud to be indigenous and to be proud to speak their language. That is what culture is about. 
allowing people to have pride in who they are and what they bring to this country. In fact, what not what they bring to this country in the case of indigenous peoples, but what we will learn from indigenous peoples about what we can, this country was like and how indigenous peoples live together as a multicultural nations who spoke different languages, who worked together, who traded together, who, who, who had real civilizations before we came as colonialists and changed it all and created what is probably the big, biggest blot of the stain in Canadian history, which is this intergenerational damage that is done to children and to families throughout the year, the residential schools and all, and, and, and all of those kinds of things. One of the other things that we are also committed to is healthy and safe indigenous communities. Looking at safe water advisory means we are actually on track to meet zero um, uh, uh, of the, to bring down to zero safe water advisories by tw May 2021 that we've been moving rapidly. It's a difficult thing to do and, and I just, I don't know why I'm being behind here. And so I, I want to say, I, in terms of safe water advisories, I remember going up when I was a minister on the shelf at Jen, and going up you know, uh, to an, an, an area where I wanted to use the bathroom, and, and First Nations two women put me on, on a schedule and we went up. And we went to the teacher's house. And when I went in there, there was flush toilets, there was running water. And yet this is where we went because children were actually every spring getting dying and getting sick from runoff. And I thought, where are we? Are we in Africa? Are we in some country where our First Nations people are treated like nothing? And, and I know at the time that there was this move to happen, but again, it's good to say you're going to do something, it has to happen. So I want to tell you that, um, that we are very clear on our platform where we're going to go with this. It's all about advancing, picking up where we are now and moving forward. And I just wanted to thank you for having me here to speak to you this morning. Thank you. Mm -hmm.